Yeah. Alan, 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 Alan Sullivan, and he commissioned uh, six months before the museum opened, he commissioned Alan Sullivan to do an exhibition called American Painting. Yeah, that's right. And Alan Sullivan, in the interim, uh, was offered a job in Irvine, went to Irvine, and he got very friendly with uh, Irwin and with uh, Craig Kaufman and with Tony Collab and a number of other people. And some two months before the museum was about to open, maybe even six weeks before the museum was about to open, uh, Alan Sullivan went to Rome and they had a meeting and said, I'm not going to do a yeah. I'm going to do a New York painting show. Yeah, and yeah. and Rowan said, well, how can you do a New York? We're opening here in California. How can you slight the California people? He said, well, I won't do it otherwise. But the museum was about to open. So Rowan said, all right, go ahead. John Copeland was working in security. Yeah. And Copeland went to Rowan and said, it's just unacceptable. Yeah. And Rowan said, what's unacceptable? He said, that Alan do a New York painting show without some West Coast representation. Rowan said, what do you suggest? And uh, John said, well, I'm going to do a West Coast show yeah. at the same time. And he did a West Coast show at the same time, except all the money, every nickel, went, went to Howard. New York. Yeah. And it looked like the West Coast people were uh, secondary. Ragtag relatives. Yeah. Ragtag yeah. relatives. Yeah. And a lot of the artists wrote to the trustees, wrote to Rowan, uh, criticizing Copeland's and defaming him and forcing him essentially out of the area, which is one of the reasons he left, if not the reason. Yeah, one, and one, just to, just, just well, finish that, just one thing to remember is that at that moment in time, Alan Sullivan was kind of the guru of that's the That's exactly right. Exactly. So they exactly. felt it would be great for the prestige of exactly the institution right. to have him out that's of the exactly moment. Right. That's, that's a big, moment. interesting moment. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. That happened, of course, sadly, several times, like when Alloway's sick painters and the yeah. object came, and then they did six more. But Lawrence picked them. But Lawrence picked right. them. But Lawrence picked them. Okay. He but did the six, right. and also he picked the six the more. Six the six more. The six more, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I have the two catalogs. Yeah. One is a <laughs> big, big catalog, and one yes. yeah. is, uh, you know, a tiny little uh, brochure. Right. right. Come on, we're at the L.A. County Museum. We had no money. That we did it all was a miracle. Come That's right. That, uh, That's that. right. So Deborah Solomon, that was her first, uh, she said that was her first, uh, Museum catalog. Contact, yeah, with it. That's right, exactly. Uh, and she did a beautiful job, actually, with a tiny little brochure. But, but let's, um, one thing Pesky, I think, when Copeland becomes curator, yeah. he does, I think, an absolutely, for a couple of years, an amazing run of shows. Amazing run of shows. Terrell, Syria, yeah. Yeah. yeah, wonderful show. Yeah. Why don't we go through some, some of your memories of that day? Or when the, uh, he shows the discs, he shows right. the first Terrell, the Xenon projection. Right, right. Uh, it was a really ambitious program, and uh, it's just so tragic that I mean, they sure couldn't have seen it. extend. <laughs> I think you want to except the casting might have been the wrong place. Right? Might have been the wrong place. Yes. Yes. In, 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 in a way, the now driving in a way that downtown is probably yes. the wrong right. place yes. for Mocha. You know, I mean, had Mocha been built in West LA, I think you would have yes. seen yes. a lot more yes. energy. Henry can get it to But why don't we take a five minute break? Henry wants a cigarette. But, right. but I'd like to pick up on the geography of the city. He's right on there because he's so close to the city and to John. And to John. Well, here's where you've got Henry and Wait, you're going to get this. Those are really special moments. Absolutely. The 60s, what was it? Oh, absolutely. I think that that. I didn't realize it was out there. I didn't realize that. I had gone to Oregon in 1972. I was thinking of it. This is the 60s. That's right. This is what? Exactly. That shouldn't be. I don't think it's even. They said that the reason the East Coast people are doing better than we're doing uh, has a lot to do with your interest. And I thought that was completely unfair. Can I say, I want to say something in Irving's uh, favor here. I, when I got there and he opened the gallery, I observed very quickly what he was dealing with, with his so-called stable. Because these were uh, headstrong, outspoken people. And even though together they were fairly collected, but yeah. individually each guy had a, his shtick, you know. Right. And I looked at Irving, and I looked at, uh, especially Irving, because uh, Walter didn't seem to 
you know, what sort of suited Walter. But I saw, I saw so much of Irving's time and energy going to uh, keeping uh, peace in that group of rascals. I like these guys, but I said, I could never deal with that. I don't want that kind of gallery because I know what you have to do. And I can't do both, you know, I can't go and, and make connections in New York and become internationally oriented myself and do this if I have to deal with six or eight mavericks, you know. When well, your relationship, it sounds was very different with the artists that you yeah. represented. Yeah. Well, I didn't. Really I well. never assembled a, a, quote, stable of people who were in daily touch with each other. They were not encouraged to be a, a clubhouse. This was not a clubhouse. And, and uh, my, my guy was much more like a club, you know. Yeah, so right. I, I, I encouraged the fact that it yeah, was but, like a club. But, 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 but I had ultimately paid a big price for yeah, it. Yeah, but there's two sides to it. Your gallery was strong because you had the pack, yeah. but it also chewed you up, yeah. and you, you had a delay doing something you otherwise would have done because you had these maps. Correct. So I looked at Irving and said, thank God for Irving, because I don't want to get caught in that. And I just deliberately stayed away from it and worked in a more direct way as a manager would work. This comes from being a lawyer and a studio executive, you know, the kind of a management uh, out with the public sort of life. I said, use those talents that you acquired in your prior life and work that side of the street. So it, actually, it was well for all of us because Irving's mission and the way he carried it out was different than mine. But together, it was a total, more of a total picture. It was very, very good. Which wasn't that I'm going to add. Which is why we got okay. on so well. Just for one minute, that's yeah. what I think. Uh, it, it seems to me that a lot of this gets down to one major issue. We talked about it last night a little bit. Uh, we talked about it yesterday morning quite a bit. The influence that Art Forum Magazine had when it was on the West Coast, it was mm -hmm. literally dealing with a lot of West Coast people before it moved to New York. Right. When it moved to New York, there was no publishing, <coughs> absolutely no publishing on the West Coast. And the whole New York scene obviously had every publication under the sun working out of that area. Right. That was one factor. The right. second factor was that when people in New York saw an Irwin painting reproduced, yeah. okay, they did all look things just like... Uh, they of course never saw an Irwin painting reproduced because he wouldn't allow... Well, but he know, did, they got... Options. But there were, there were a couple... There were a couple of stats. But, but there was a cover, that cover that he... Right. Yeah. That he didn't... That he hated. Right, yeah. yeah. Right. But, but the, the point was that New York, even in seeing in reproduction, Words of West Coast artists compared it always to New York art. It really just looks like so forth. So they've right. never seen the painting. They've never it's seen the It's a monochrome. Yeah. Exactly right. Right. And uh, so that was a big factor. Uh, the third factor, clearly, is that New York was not interested in showing Los Angeles artists. You remember that from the early Bankston show when he went to Martha Jackson and bombed. Okay, and that was the, that was it. And then the fourth factor that gets in the head, given the certain there were the comments that were made. The fact that occasionally now, certain people like Larry Bell were gaining a broader audience. They were actually being seen in New York galleries, as a yeah. fact, as was Ed Boucher, for example, being seen in, what's his name, right. well, and oh, later, and later Leo, you know, but yeah. you know, all that time. Uh, and these were the second generation artists after the pack, okay, and so that was grading right. on them. Absolutely. So, great. They, well, let's talk about, not too happy about Bell's success. No, I know. If you don't mind, let me talk about Larry. Bell just that uh, seemed to really yeah. sort of blow things apart. Yeah. Sort of that, that was one issue that blew things apart. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and then just the mere fact that uh, he was doing a piece of sculptures, these glass boxes, and uh, uh, Arnold Glimcher came to California. From Pace. From Pace and visited uh, Larry in his studio. And then came back to see me and said, uh, I like Larry Bell. And I said, how many pieces would you need for a show? And he said, I'd need 10. And I said, well, logistically, uh, let me see how that'll work. And uh, I went to, to Larry and I said, 
can you do 20 pieces? And he said, why? And I said, Glimcher is interested in showing uh, a body of your work. And he feels he needs 10 pieces. I'd like to show 10 pieces um, virtually at the same time, maybe a little after. So we're going to require 20 sculptures. And he said, I can do 20 sculptures. And I said, what would it cost? And he said, let me think about it. Let me get back to you in a couple of days. And he got back to me in a couple of days, and he said, it'll cost $20,000. And I have to have it in front before I can even begin. He had to buy some, some equipment. He had to buy, no. buy the equipment. He had to buy it. Uh, a glass coating machine, no. whatever. He needed $20,000. Needed $20,000. I, I called Plutcher, and I said, uh, I've asked him for 20 pieces. 10 for me, 10 for you. Larry needs $20,000 in order to fulfill this uh, situation. Glimpse just said, I'll give you 10000 for the work that I want. I said, great, great, that's the beginning. Um, and so I had $10,000. Uh, I went to several people and finally went to my, my backup lady, Sadie Moss, who really gave us lots of money and supported the gallery, and did one thing or another, and I explained the entire situation to her uh, as carefully as I could. And also, I, I, I established a plan as to when I, and how I would pay her back. Every nickel I got for the, for the first two, three, four pieces would go directly to her. Nothing to the artist. Well, the artist has already been paid, but nothing to me, nothing to the gallery, everything back to her. And I assured her that I had sales for the work, for at least half of what it was I wanted. She said, Irving, I will give you $10,000. I called Larry immediately. I said, Larry, I've got $20,000. You can begin this enterprise. Uh, Larry said, great. How did you do it? I said, for me to know, for you to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Next day, Billy Albanston comes in the gallery yeah, yeah. and says to me, Irving, I said, no. He says, I want $20,000. Oh, I said, Billy, you don't really understand. He says, I want $20,000. I said, let me explain. He leaves, walks out of the gallery. And that was it. Listen. And never came back. Er, er, uh, Larry Bell was minister eventually to uh, Tops. And uh, I showed up in Santa Fe in uh, 80, about 83. And uh, I rather quickly looked up uh, Larry, because I hadn't seen him in, in a long time. And he was uh, delighted to see me. And it was very warm from the beginning. And he, uh, he had these you know, recollections of our scene. And, and uh, we had something in common, is that I left and he left. And he told me what it was his perception of what was going on, you know, in his world. Larry is entrepreneurial, has an entrepreneurial core to himself. Correct. And he was able, when he got off on his own and he went to Taos, he became, he taught himself to be an impresario, you know, uh, uh, a stage manager, uh, a, a guy who puts his own graphics together. He became an entrepreneur and his business was himself. And he did it exceedingly well. With one problem. What? He, he went from the boxes to the walls That's right. to the invisible walls right. that people kept bagging into. That's right. No, what he was doing, when I met him, he was doing those interesting things. On paper? No, on uh, canvas paintings. Yeah, the paintings. paintings. Well, that's uh, much later. And, and, uh, but uh, there was a long, yeah, yeah. fallow that's right. period. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But when I'm so discouraged. Shells had disappeared. Yes, right. exactly. <laughs> But exactly. when I met him, he's starting to do these folding paintings, and I said, uh, Larry, let me write some sort of a little statement for you about how Every, you do We haven't it. heard the end of the Larry Bell story. Right. He's back in LA, he's right. back making a market. Right. Right. Yeah. On Market Street. Why don't you he's back in the thing. He's back in the Philippines, making a He's back in Los Angeles. Yeah, he's on Market Street six months ago. Back in his old studio. So, and then they rested oh, the well, in, in, in Taos? Taos. Okay. Well, when Billy left, every... Uh, he had every, a wife divorced. E everybody... Oh, he, he never got married. He never, got he never married. were married. Uh, but everybody else in the gallery 
had two versions of the story. They had my version, which I gave them, and they had Billy Al's version. And they weren't entirely sympathetic to Billy Al, and they weren't entirely sympathetic to me. Somehow I was blamed for Larry's success. That's right. He was younger than all of them. That's right. He was younger. With $20,000 in his hands. More money than they, they had ever seen in a lifetime. In a lifetime. Did you all the pennies that they sold the whole time? So was it uneasy? <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, was a turning point? That was a turning point. Yeah. That was a dirty one. That's when it went from a club well, to, uh, with uh, enormous it, affection. Isn't that human nature, though, in anything that happened yeah. whether it's Picasso, yeah. Matisse, or... Okay. or well, I can't talk about because of the... Rock, uh, you know. Uh, or the, 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 almost the opposite yeah. of, of that story that Uri was telling you is the relationship between artists and Gemini, where it seemed that from the beginning you made it part of the business to You'd meet them at the airport. You'd have transportation for them. You'd have a place for them to stay. You had plenty of people on hand to. I was help. I was thrilled about Gemini from the beginning because they were showing a lot of the people that I was showing, right. and they took most of the burden. Yeah, that's right. They and took most of the burden. The they were paying for hotel rooms. Hotel. That's right. You know, Kelly would come out, stay in the shop, yeah. Gemini. You know. It never seemed to be. And now Richard says it's four seasons. Oh, you got the Four Seasons, uh, Richard, the, the proletariat. It never seemed to be an issue. Uh, they probably were conscious of each other's work, but each one got... And, and their deal was the same. Their part of the royalties from the net receipts percentage was the same. So it, it just... I don't remember it being no. much of an issue ever. What I'm saying is, is, is we it didn't not... think about that it would be an issue. Yeah. Not competition, but instead that you became like the whatever the Cadillac model of how it was. But they went to club yeah. because they were working at Gemini. They were these individuals. They were working individually. Individually, so yeah. we yeah. Um, we weren't putting them together. They didn't make them at all. So yeah. every yeah. once in a while you do an anniversary know, show. Something. Uh, that, that helped, I think, because it helped to be less competition. I think. But didn't you find? I'm saying almost the opposite. Irving was talking about tension. Well, it seems to me that at a certain point, after Gemini really gets going, yeah. everybody wants to get that call to some... come and work at Gemini. Yeah. And they're, they're the, the only competition would have been, well, they haven't approached me yet. Because... I mean, that was, uh, it's hard for me but, to accept yeah. that part of it. It may have happened. Well, yeah. But I think also, there was so I mean, Albers was always very conscious of what the prices were. Yeah. And, and yeah. But you were, you were is very conscious of prices, and so but they like to compare. They always, compare they always to, like to compare to jazz. Yeah, right. So that always made it easier because they accepted he was going to be the team. Yeah, yeah. So that that they couldn't okay. stand it when jazz was sold for fifteen thousand. No, they had some accepted. That's there. right. There's, there's a different model here in your business. Uh, the nature of the product and the, and the channels of distribution of the product required you. To start work with somebody who, who was uh, more than a rookie, you had to talk with people who have been established and had some experience. Irving had the courage to get this group of rascals together, and uh, they were arrogant and unsure all at the same time. Bad combination. Sure. And I, I really am in his well, debt by saving me that experience. Right. No, I well, look at him and say, well, it's the same as ultimately there's a market and something will sell for yeah, a certain price. Right. And the dealer can temporarily screw up the market or make it stronger, right. but ultimately it, it decides itself. And if you have a group of people who are not doing very well, uh, they're going to compare it to the people that are in their right. group. Well, there is another, there is another like little the market. Yeah. Somehow, Irving was a subject to that, you know. Yeah. Here, Arnold was going to have a show and putting up half the money in that. Yeah. Yeah. And Billy wasn't having a That's show well, and was putting up in that. But the point is, the point is that, that, you know, that you were in your business, as, as we just pointed out, there was money there at the beginning when they came, and they, and they knew what the situation was. It was very clear. They were already selling art, so it's a whole different story. But there was a criticism of Gemini, which went on for a period of time, and that's the fact that they didn't do any Los Angeles artists. Now they did L2, obviously, they did they, they did appreciate, did get any price. Yeah, but, probably seven, no, six or seven. I know, but yeah, six or seven, that's not very many when you get right down to it. But the point is that 
But that, that was a criticism. It was a criticism yeah. that, that, they, that they were just doing the blue chip New York people. Yeah. What about the criticism were virtue women? Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. but then Sarah started. It's of course been the been, been, been the criticism of every of, of every mocha right. doesn't yeah. show local or black. Yeah. 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 Right. I'm not sure Billy didn't did because uh, we never did Billy. But Billy was fabulous. Billy was fabulous to one extent. He was the first artist out here that I knew of that said, we need to control our own markets more and know more about it. We are lambs. We're being taken advantage of. He overstated it. But up to then, a lot of the artists, and that wasn't an issue. You, you showed, you got paid, sometimes right. you didn't. And Billy set up, he called it Art Studio and made the artist very aware of the business end of it. Now talk a little bit about his showroom. His showroom, right. Well, yeah. He tried to set himself up. He tried to set himself up, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Larry did it more intelligently. Well, Larry, I told you, Larry was a <laughs> yeah. God given entrepreneur. Yeah. He made the right moves in yes. the beginning. And Larry's tough. Yeah. I mean, he knows how to do it. Uh, really but I, but it. you have to be honest and say they have both suffered by being working outside the system. I don't care how you well, how you system. raise it or what you say. They both suffer. Absolutely. I have a It's wonderful. Well, while I in general have nothing but good things to say about Germany, I have a, a more pointed critique that I'd like you to talk about, which is that when Nick Wilder left the business in 79, he said, he had this comment, he said, the major artists, some of which I have represented, got too expensive for me to say I'm selling in LA. I couldn't, I couldn't get 50, 60,000 a canvas here. So that left me showing younger, less established artists. He said, but why would someone spend 5000 for one of those paintings when they could get a Jasper John print for the same, amount, the same of amount of money? It's an yeah. interesting statement, but it's a different wire. Well, it's a different wire. I mean, it's, it's, it's a different wire. It's, it's a statement yeah. that's naive in its way, because uh, the people that want the younger artists to be part of that, with what you have with a Jasper with Jones 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 painting up there yeah. or a sculpture than a Jasper Jones Well, Well, but, 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 but the, so it does overlap some, but not as yeah. much as that. Because prints then became, you know, they became very expensive in the minds of people who had been buying them for $100, like right. myself. So. Uh, and it did become a thing that sat on your living room wall, which was a Jasper Jones print or whatever, it was a Russian print or whatever. But Irving, you made a point earlier, and I know it's a statement that you made in the past, where in Los Angeles, you simply couldn't sell works of art worth thirty-five thousand dollars. Oh, the price of the BMW. That was a cutoff point. That's a cutoff. Well, let's follow up with this because it ties back to something that we didn't go through fully, which is the Hollywood. What what the young dealers tell me here yeah. is that it's a sheep mentality. So if you work for CAA and the top agent oh, has nice. a Lichtenstein painting on the wall, yeah. yeah. The junior ones all get Lichtenstein prints. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That hasn't, yeah. that hasn't traveled as well. No. Look at no. The, the entertainment industry has had a history that hasn't changed a lot. Number one, Correct. you know better than your last picture or your last thing, right. and there's no foundation there. Very few of them have the the feeling that they can go out and spend money because uh, they don't know what the, they're going to be a failure maybe the next year. Vincent so, Wright is that classic point that yeah, Vincent no. Wright said to me, I did, here's, here's a wealthy man living in a lovely house in, yeah. in, in Beverly Land with uh, still working, making horror pictures and yeah. so forth and so on. And we were chatting one day and he said, Henry, he said, he said, you just have to understand, he said, that, that I never know if I'm going to be able to make another movie again. He said, that's, and, uh, well, and if I don't, it's I've got to take care of myself. And, and it's great if you're fundraising, right. if you want glamour to dinner, if you want someone to appear. Yeah. They've been fabulous for that, and so we shouldn't put them down. But there's always this feeling that there's a lot of money there, whether it's collecting, and there are some exceptions in anything, but it's never been there in comparison with uh, uh, industrial people. Well, the you know, money is there, but the ego is there, too. But, but, well, yeah, there's yeah, very yeah, sense there's criticism. criticism. Pure criticism. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One uh, side slide remark, and, and they I don't want to look at yeah, it. So it's, 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 I don't think there's ever going to be a lot different than that. I mean, what's amazing to me, I mean, because a friend of mine, he got a $15 million bonus last year. He was involved with uh, uh, Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. He did 
I mean, that's the kind of money, and they, because you, you can't tell me that they can't afford a fifty thousand dollars. They can more than they did, and it's, there's a little more of it, but it's not stable. Well, somehow there's a feeling I may need that for the rest of my life because I may not do another Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Also, there's a kind of hurdle to equate art with so money. Money mentality. mentality. Never get over that hurdle. That's right. What? They just start equating art with money. You know. Yeah. yeah, a, yeah a, a, a lot of them never get image, over that hurdle. Image about an image. A, what yeah. is the art? What image? Yeah. Rather than someone that really, you know, you think creative people, but sometimes it doesn't travel. Well, okay. Love another creation and that. And there's well, some of that. There are a few, like Steve Martin, for them. Yeah. Steve Martin is the exception. Yeah, Steve Martin is the exception. Absolutely. Can I ask, when you spoke before, you were saying, you were referring to Hollywood, it's what a big disappointment it was. So I guess what I was wondering is, what was the expectations? Well, where, how were they going to come in to be supportive? Well, I would say, I would say a couple of things. I would say, one, that, um, that in the 60s, these collectors were accessible. And there are a string of collectors today in California, like Geffen, like Steve Martin, like Ovitz, like uh, Eli Broad. You can't call them. You simply can't call them. There's no chance that you can see what they have because you can't even get through to them. You, you go to a secretary, and the secretary says, what's your business? Well, uh, I'm a collector, and I'm interested in seeing what He'll get back to you. You never hear from him again. It's just impossible. It doesn't happen. Uh, that's, that's one aspect of what I was saying. The second aspect of what I was saying is that by this time, there's a history here. I mean, people have been buying art. People have been buying art successfully for a long time uh, in, in California. And you would think that the movie industry would become alert to that, or would be aware of that. It would somehow be responsive to that. It would somehow follow in certain, certain people's footsteps. You'd think that Steve Martin, who has a brilliant collection, house here, apartment in New York, would have five acolytes, five people saying, gosh, Steve, you've done brilliantly here. What did you pay for that? What's it worth now? That much more? Wow. Where do I go? Direct me. Help me. I'd like to do the same. But he doesn't. It doesn't happen. He's not yeah, surrounded by nearly as much. He's not. It happens. But Hollywood people fragile. do yeah, not have a feel solid. Hollywood people don't have a confidence in their ability to select. No, they buy the true. one, put it up, it's true. and then have enough ones adds up to what he calls a collection, and then he's sort of done. They may not feel they have the time either to really go into it and really study. Well, it's not hip about many other are simply not involved with contemporary art. No, exactly. The, the people that would buy art yeah. in the time that we're talking about in the late 50s, early 60s, would buy a third-rate impressionist painting because yeah. that's what they yeah. thought. But the they funny thing art famine, something is that these, these no more uh, elegant individuals like a Robert Neckel Skull on the East Coast became huge pop art collectors, you would think that a lot of these Hollywood people would be the West Coast equivalent, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Well, they had no, an interest in who the Skull was. Someone like Skull, I think, had an interest in getting into the social group. Into the exactly. Social interest. Group. Exactly. Exactly. And so exactly. That was his goal in life. That was his goal in life. And the guy had no history. Well, if you're in the motion picture, no history. you're not his <laughs> part of it. Well, no, no. you just made the <laughs> most important point. Here are these people who project themselves on the screen. Yes. We all know who yeah. you yeah. see walking down the street, who are this and that, and so forth and so on. They don't need to build a social enclave. No, no, they are. Every major already. collector that we know, yeah. from Fred Wiseman to Eli Broad, right up, they're buying prestige. They're That's buying right. a social position. That's right. Well, having right. started with, with very little. With very little. That's yeah. exactly right. And of course, the huge difference, we were talking a little bit about ethnic. But in New York, the the post Jewish assimilation and modern art went so hand in hand. And once you got yourself on the MoMA board, you really arrived. That's right. And there wasn't really an equivalent yeah. on the West Coast. It, yeah. Being on the board of LA County probably didn't cement your social standing any more than Many other things. Well, did. I can give you a clue to that. And this is this is not a Los Angeles story, it's a San Francisco story. I put together, with the help of a couple of wonderful people like Gene Trefeth and the head of Kaiser, uh, a board of 
prominent people who were not that many collectors, not that much involved, so we sat on our board. We traveled all around the country. They met Leo Castelli. They met Andre Emery. Right. They met Irving. They met this. They met that. Uh, they met the museum people, and suddenly they were asked to sit on the Museum of Modern Art Council of Drawing. So they were asked to sit on the board of the National Gallery or whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely pure social climbing, you know, and, and I'm not making that a negative, it's an American phenomenon, no. but, that's, yeah. but that's exactly yeah. what it was. You know, and, yeah. and now they are yeah. making well, shots and saying, all right, you know. And that had some aspect of the religious, but it goes in a lot of ways. And again, not to put it down, something like a Peter Norton yeah. wanted to use that money to get into places that was there. Yeah, so it, very it goes about. past the religious thing, oh, the Jews were excluded more from kind of certain social things, but it was uh, it's a, it's a, it's a way. But um, uh, it, there there's still are plenty of real collectors and people who love the art and love the creative part. Of honest, Jewish, Jewish yeah. people have more passion. That's very simple. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I mean, it was so easier than do more money. Than you. Well, well, I'm, I'm, I'm an honorary Jew. You know that as well as I do. The big thing is that there yeah. weren't many, especially in you, New York, sorry, in the late. 40s, for, there weren't many avenues for that social acceptance for Jews, and, and modern art yeah. was one. And I think that's why that was so important. Yeah, now, of course, there are sure. I mean, There was always opera and uh, theater. Some of I mean, it. after after um, Henry left, uh, opera, ballet, and yeah. other big. Yeah. I mean, uh, after Henry left San Francisco, of course, the generation of uh, Silicon Valley yeah. and uh, entrepreneurs. That was the and SM Volvo became yeah. their. Well, it used to be, uh, it used to be family and inheritance. Now it's just right. money. Yeah, that's right. Just that's money. Right. That's how it's changed. But yeah. see, in, in New York, the social structure was such that a uh, Robert Skull, who was only claimed to fame was a student of taxi cabs, yeah. yeah. was not, not a very I, big well, one. Like Twenty cabs, big deal. <laughs> uh, this, uh, the great. Great. No. The great thing I remember. Well, I, was I, got a, I got a, a Christmas card. The Skull family sitting in their dining room. Giant Rosenquist over a sideboard. Long table. Mr. Skull here. Mrs. Skull here. The two boys sitting on French furniture with plastic doilies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I went to my lawyer at the time. You I said, I want to reproduce it. He went, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> But you see, in New York, there was a structure where you could, you could climb the ladder in New York by being a collector. But we didn't have that, um, that cultural matrix here in Los Angeles. We didn't have a society that was so multifaceted that there were various avenues to gain prestige in the society. Art uh, collecting being one of them, an acceptable pathway for a guy like Skull. We didn't have that. We didn't have a society that was so structured. Part of our charm. That, that's, not, <laughs> no, no, that's absolutely not true. It was a smaller well, segment. Yeah. But we've all named, 12 names who were collectors, yeah. predominantly Jewish, and they think we really all vying for the same reason, social yeah. prestige, yeah. and all creating a new right. environment, even including the most brilliant one of them all, Martin Simon. You, know, mm. that's a, that's a, you think really Norton did it? Was it well, he had passion. I mean, he, he, had had passion. Passion. he had passion, he had intellect. But, but that still didn't stop. Even though he was supposed to abstract art. Because he didn't want to be too involved with in in institutions until he finally built his own. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he was on the board of Lackman earlier, yeah. but he uh, he wasn't an institution. But simply, so he didn't have showing so he wouldn't have to store it somewhere. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm talking about. But that. sort of big difference, I mean, you can tell me still, but I think as someone who knows, but it mean, it seems like he would have much more social cachet in Los Angeles to be on the board of Cedar Sinai. Then it would be to be on the board. Of one of the things I was shocked by one of the most prestigious boards in the country, and so that happened. Uh, so that was a prestigious board, and it was virt virtually all Jewish. Although we're having our first Gentile is going to be president of the board, a guy named John Ma, who happens to be Carmen Marshall, Harvey Lewin's son-in-law, and uh, uh, the it, it's been multicultural. The chief of staff was Afro-American and uh, that sort of thing. But yes, you're right, it came in a different direction some here. Uh, another prestigious thing here was something like maybe UCLA or USC being uh, uh, the schools, being on those boards, medical more medical than medical. a, uh, than yeah, medical. medical. Yeah. Now I want to turn a little bit, because I've got two of you here, and one thing that's fascinating about is that you both worked at different times for Marlboro, 
<laughs> a very, very different model of how a gallery operates. We ought to recognize the Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Let's talk about the, the, what, how they tried to set up dealing art, and both it was both pretty negative experience. Well, let me, so let, like me, let me tell you about Marlboro because I was uh, I joined them when they were scheming and opening the, the New York Gallery. So I saw <laughs> what they considered uh, their MO in order to uh, position themselves in New York. But they, they had a lot of money. I mean, the Marlboro had made money, it had investors over in Europe, I don't know who they were, but he was, Frank Lloyd was banked in the beginning and he did well. They came with all the money you could want to establish a beachhead in New York. And he, he had enough money to woo any artist away from somebody else by giving them a better deal with guarantees and even a draw. So he comes to New York and uh, uh, he rents a whole floor of a nice office building on 57th, yeah, just nice. a few steps from Madison Avenue. Right. And I mean, it was a big floor. It wasn't as big as my gallery, but for New York it was huge. And he lays in a slate floor, completely slate, all the way across. Hires the, the architect, who, uh, who MoMA's architect, uh, Green, or Bonner Green. And he puts in a very fancy space, and he waves the money around, and he moves enough artists from New York as a foothold, and then he, he handpicks his, uh, from his European group artists who could show well in New York. So he, he knew that he had the power to come in and get a beachhead on, on the way he liked to do it. And he, he missed no tricks. So once the gallery opened, uh, we had an elevator, three elevators in the building. Uh, on Saturdays, he'd go down to the guy that ran the elevators, and he'd give them a $50 each uh, for Saturday, so that when anybody says Marlboro, he goes, he takes the elevator to that floor before he lets anybody else up the elevator. <laughs> but let's, I, I want to hear, because the, the Frank Lloyd was, was, let me just, have whatever you like, but we're going to go to lunch in 15 minutes. I couldn't resist, I'm sorry. Irving and Stanley, take whatever you want, but we're going to go to lunch in 15 minutes. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Irving, come on now. Uh, okay. All right. So let's, but let's hear about, because Frank Lloyd, to me, is kind of the pre-